The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. Senator Mark Pryor is joining us on The Communicators this week. He's chair of the Commerce Subcommittee on Communications Technology and the Internet. Senator Pryor, your full committee recently approved Tom Wheeler to be FCC nominee. Is Senator Cruz, your colleague, has talked about putting a hold on that nomination. Is there any word on that right now? Well, we're working on that. Let, let me first say thank you for having me on. It's great to be on the show. And also let me say thank you to C-SPAN for all the public interest broadcasting they do. It's great. And it's, I know you don't believe this, but we have people in Arkansas say, hey, I saw you on C-SPAN. Hey, we watch C-SPAN a lot. So thank, I want to thank C-SPAN for what they do. Yeah, let me get back to the Tom Wheeler nomination. Um, basically, there's a, a sentiment in the, within the Senate that we ought to pair this with a Republican nominee. I think everybody's comfortable with Tom Wheeler as far as I know, but the Republicans would like to have a Republican to go alongside through the process. Problem is that we have not, uh, uh, at least officially, I mean, I hear rumors, but officially, uh, we have not uh, received the Republican uh, name of who they'd like you know, nominated. So um, um, I understand it may be in process. You know, I don't, I don't know the whole status of that. I've not been officially notified, but I hear rumors. But nonetheless, um, hopefully we'll get this done quickly. Hopefully that uh, Senator uh, Rockefeller has said publicly, and he said in the hearing that he wanted to expedite that and move it through as quickly as possible so we can have them paired on the floor. My view is you don't have to pair them. I mean, it's kind of a Senate courtesy. I think if we can do it in such a way that, you know, it doesn't delay too long of a time for Tom Wheeler to take over, that's okay. But if it's going to take a long time, this is going to be protracted, I would go ahead and try to get Tom Wheeler on. Well, one of the concerns that Senator Cruz expressed was about political speech and restricting political speech if the FCC was going to do that. I don't really share that concern. Uh, I think the FCC, you know, that's a hard job being on the FCC. I think people don't always appreciate it, but it's one of those jobs where it's very difficult to make everyone happy. And oftentimes when you do something, you don't make anyone happy. And I just don't see them weighing in on political speech. I, I don't see that that's a big agenda item for anyone. Um, but, you know, certainly uh, it is something they could do, you know, conceivably, but I don't, I don't see them doing that. So my view is, look, we have to have a, a, a well-functioning uh, FCC. Let's get the chairman in there. Let, let's get rolling. Let's get as many commissioners as possible. If we can get the Republican on quickly, let's try to do that. If we can do them together, that's fine. I don't, I don't really have a big objection to that. But I like fully functioning agencies and boards and commissions. Well, Senator Pryor, I also wanted to ask you about a set of hearings that you've been holding in your subcommittee. Um, what's the goal of these hearings, and do you see legislative action coming from them? Possibly. Uh, for your viewers that aren't that familiar with the uh, communications uh, tele, uh, communi communications tele, uh, what, what is it? Technology, excuse me, communications technology and internet subcommittee. I was garbling that. But the CTI subcommittee, uh, we've had a series, we've started the Congress with a series of four, we call them state of hearings. And so we have the state of rural telecom. Uh, we have the state of wireless telecom, the state of wireline telecom, and uh, the fourth one, let's see, I'll have to think about what that is, but nonetheless, the idea is to, we have a lot of new committee members, subcommittee members, about maybe 25, 30 percent are new, but let's kind of hear from the industry, hear from all the stakeholders, let's try to get all these, uh, everybody sort of acclimated to the issues, understand where all the issues are, get the state of play, that's why we call it the state of hearings. And then once we get these four done, which we have, then we can move forward. Uh, uh, state of video was the fourth one, state of video. And so um, once we get these four done, then we really have kind of laid the groundwork to really look at legislation. The one thing the subcommittee has to do by the end of next year is STELA, which is the satellite reauthorization. And you all know that. And it uh, sounds like your audience here is a pretty sophisticated audience on telecom and all the things about all this. So they probably know what Stella is, but that's a satellite uh, telecommunications law. That means if you get DISH or, you know, one of the other uh, uh, networks, uh, satellite networks, then, then Stella is going to govern. The question is, do we do kind of a clean reauthorization? Do we just kind of basically roll it over, maybe with some changes to modernize it, update it? Or do we actually start getting into some policy issues? And that's, that's really the question. I think what I'm hearing mostly from the committee and the subcommittee is they'd like to do a clean reauthorization. But again, 
you have to understand that this is one of those rare bills where you have joint jurisdiction between us and the Senate Judiciary Committee. So we're going to have to work with our colleagues on Judiciary. And of course, the House, they have two committees there. So, you know, this is going to be a, a four-step process instead of a two-step process. Well, joining our conversation with Senator Pryor is Gautam Nagesh, who is a technology reporter with CQ Roll Call. Thanks, Peter. Senator, you referenced the State of the Wireline Committee hearing. What, in your opinion, is the State of Wireline Communications, and how does the universal concept of universal service play in today's market where wireless internet, wireless phones, broadband internet are perhaps more important to many consumers than, say, their landline? Yeah, you touched on three or four very important issues that deal with wireline. First, the wireline network is the backbone of our whole telecommunications system. We need wires. I mean, there's no doubt. If you, if you have a cell phone and you call from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, at some point it's going to go over a land-based system. You don't, you know, you don't talk wirelessly all the way across the country. You, you connect into a cell tower and then it goes. So the wireline system, all of the wires, not just into the home, but the wired system is very important. It is the backbone. It's, it's critically important. The other thing you, you mentioned before is there is this big transition going on now. You mentioned wireless, and it, and it is huge. And if you look at the numbers, clearly you see the big trend lines, but also um, there's the IP transition as well, the Internet Protocol transition, where a lot of the phone companies, the incumbent carriers, they're saying, look, we're going over... We're getting away from the traditional copper wire, the, the traditional tele telephony that we think of that has been regulated the same way for decades. We need to have a new generation of regulation, which basically what they would like to say is no regulation or very little, or very light regulation. Um, so with your traditional phone, like when we all grew up, um, like I grew up in Arkansas, I probably didn't realize it at the time, but uh, Southwestern Bell who was my local carrier, they had obligations to me. They were the carrier of last resort. They had other obligations to me as a customer because they had a monopoly. The monopolies are kind of gone. I mean, they are gone, kind of, but um, so, so some of these uh, companies want to come in and say, well, as we're doing this IP transition, let's just get away from regulation. Let's go totally unregulated. Let's get rid of all these obligations. That concerns me. In fact, that may be the subject of a hearing in our subcommittee at some point. We haven't announced, we haven't even decided, but we're looking at that because this issue really came up during the wireline uh, hearing that we had, and I think it's an issue that may deserve you know, further discussion. You also touched on another aspect of this, which is that the traditional phone line system, because of the regulations attached to it, is far more reliable and perhaps resilient in the face of natural disasters than some of the issues we've seen with cell phone networks in areas that have been affected by natural disasters. Do you think there is any possibility for Congress to act in that area to require wireless carriers to take on some of the same responsibilities that landline carriers used to have? I think that's what we talk about. I think that's one thing the subcommittee can talk about, the full committee, the Senate for that matter, but we can talk about that. But you're right. You know, when you were asking that question, I was thinking of uh, examples in Arkansas where, say, we've had really bad thunderstorms or tornadoes or ice storms, something like that, where it knocks the power lines down. We go without power, but our landline still works because it's on a different system. And that redundancy is a good thing in a natural disaster. And we've seen oftentimes when your power goes out, if the power goes out in the wrong places, then your cell phone itself may have power. I mean, you could have a battery, but you can't connect anywhere because those towers are down. So we've seen that in a lot of natural disasters. Um, we need to build in that redundancy. We need to make sure that our phone system works maybe especially in time of an emergency. But that's, that's something we really need to focus on. The other thing that you haven't really mentioned yet, which is critical, is rural America. We, we mentioned we had a, had a hearing on rural America because it, the, the, the economics of rural America really haven't changed. It's just like back in the old days, they couldn't get electricity in rural America, so they set up the REA. Uh, they couldn't get telephone service, so they set up a universal service fund. You know, and a lot of this is changing. There's a ton of change in this world, but we just need to make sure that rural America is not left behind. Actually, I drove home to Michigan this weekend, and I couldn't help but notice precisely perhaps what you're referring to, which is that cell phone coverage varies greatly, and obviously the rural areas are the areas where it is not as strong. Right. What can be done about this? We do have things. The USF has been shifted towards wireless in some aspect, but the most of it is going towards broadband, wired right. broadband. Right. So what can be done in the wireless space? 
Well, this is something I think that the FCC has grappled with, the House and Senate have grappled with this. I don't think we have a clear answer in terms of a clear consensus, but obviously a lot of what we talk about here is money. The economics of providing uh, rural wireless are just not as good as they are in urban areas. You just have a density of population, that means a density of paying customers. You go to rural America, I mean, you know, we have stretches of Arkansas that, you know, you're driving, you know, 10, 20, 30 miles before you see another house. You go to places like Montana, you maybe see 100, 200 miles before you see another house. You know, Alaska, you're maybe a thousand miles before you see another house. But nonetheless, these are all challenges and it's, the economics don't really work to provide state-of-the-art wireless out there in those areas because they can't recoup. So that's why things like the Universal Service Fund and others, we have you know other names for it, but basically the same thing. That's why that's so important. We need to make sure that those folks in rural America don't get left behind. We don't want a tale of two countries here where we have the urban and suburban over here and they have the latest and the greatest and they're cutting edge and then rural America is just on two generations ago technology, that, that's not, that doesn't work. That's not good. It's not good for anybody. We need to connect rural America. So, Senator Pryor, do you foresee USF reform legislation coming in this Congress? Well, there again, this is another thing we maybe should have a hearing on because we spent a lot of time on USF. Uh, I, bet, I bet you a third of the witnesses in these four hearings that one way or another mention USF and talking about how the Universal Service Fund, and again, there may be different names of it as it sort of changes and transitions itself, but nonetheless, that USF, that Universal Service Fund, which basically means that everybody pays a little bit into a fund, and then that fund goes to help customers, usually in rural America, but it could be low-income customers, whatever. Uh, but we want to make sure that everybody has can connect. And, you know, my view of this is, um, if you think about American history, um, Initially, when, when the first European settlers came, they had to be on the coast because they had to connect with trade and communications back to Europe. And then as time went on, you know, you could settle on rivers. In fact, you look at all the U.S. cities today, almost all of them, almost all of them, not in every, every single one, but the big cities, they're almost all either on the coast or on big rivers. Why? That's because that's how the country grew because they were on that river system. And so then when the steam engine came along and things like that, you do paddle boats, you get further up the rivers, and, you know, man could have a little more control over that. And then with the railroads, but there was a time that if you were not on a railroad, you, you might as well not exist. You know, your town would just drive and blow away if it wasn't on the railroad. We see that in the history of our state, and I know every other state. And now, you know, in the last, since I've been around, it's been interstates. For anybody that wants to do economic development, you have to have interstates. Well, today, though, it's broadband. Broadband is really that thing. It's, it's that one extra piece you have to have or you're just not going to get jobs in certain areas, you know. And it's important for a state like Arkansas to do things like telemedicine and other things where you can provide some services like health care services, some of those services to the most rural areas of our state with the greatest doctors in the world because you can connect by broadband. And so there's a huge amount of power in that. That's a great thing and that's why we need to make sure rural America isn't left behind. Well, when it comes to wireless communications or video uh, services, is there enough competition in your view? And can the Senate, can the Congress do anything to increase that competition? Well, in, you said in wireline or wireless? Wireless. Wireless. Uh, you know, that's a hyper-competitive industry, and they just beat up on each other all the time. Um, the truth is that it's very, very competitive in most areas of the country. There's numerous uh, wireless carriers in most areas, but in also in most areas, there's kind of the big two. The, they, the, you know, AT&T and Verizon, listen, they're great at what they do. They've gotten in there and competed. They played by the rules and they've, they've grown their market share. And so what happens is you have kind of everybody else makes up that third competitor. I think we want to make sure that that third competitor, which is really a conglomeration of companies, and we know some of their names, and a lot of names are little regional names that we don't, you know, or little local names that we don't really know, but they're in there fighting hard and they're trying to provide service as well. We need to make sure that that level, that, that playing field is level so everybody can compete because that really, people that say, I don't like regulation, well, the answer to that is competition. If you have real competition that's robust, that it's fair, and, you know, once you get a, a competitive advantage, you can't just, you know, dominate. But if you have fair competition, that's the answer to regulation, is 
just have good, fair competition, good marketplace, let consumers have a lot of choice. And you're watching the Communicators program on C-SPAN. Our guest, Senator Mark Pryor, a Democrat from Arkansas. He is chair of the Commerce Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, and the Internet. Our guest reporter this week is Gautam Nagesh of CQ Roll Call. Senator, you referred to broadband <coughs> as being vital to the future, especially for rural areas. So then, do you believe that broadband should be something that every household has access to, either through some sort of USF <coughs> subsidy or a program similar? I would like to see that. You know, traditionally, we pretty much had that policy in this country for telephones, that every telephone, you know, every, every household basically had the right to have access to telephone service. You know, I'm sure it didn't work out in 100% of the cases. There's always going to be those really hard to serve, really difficult areas. But I do think that trying to get broadband to as many houses as possible and the right level of broadband, not, you know, not some, you know, fly-by-night, cheapy type service, but something that really people can actually have access and actually use it. Now, well, you know how it is. Not everybody wants it. I mean, I have, I know people, they don't have the internet. They don't want it. But the number of people that don't is very, very small. Most people I talk to, they want it, they love it, they continue to rely on it. It's important for business, it's important for just the way they communicate now. You know, do these things like Facebook, Twitter, you know, whatever it happens to be, websites. Um, that's how people communicate. That's how uh, grandparents stay in touch with their grandchildren, you know, things like that. So that is one of the beautiful things about all this technology in, in, in America. America is so innovative. I mean, you put it out there, we're going to find ways to use it, and we're going to do things that are just simply amazing that you never thought could exist 10 years ago. And that's really the story of the Internet. Now, while broadband is increasingly popular, statistics show that adoption remains in the 60%, 60s, basically. Um, cost is most frequently cited as the major reason. Do you think anything can be done about that? I think consumers are familiar with the fact that broadband costs continue to rise. In some cases, performance also rises, not in all. Right. What is your view of that marketplace? Well, I do think that that's a real problem. You look at a state like mine, and I know Arkansas is not unique, but we have a lot of people who are low income, and it's hard for them to afford that monthly uh, <coughs> uh, Internet service provider fee. I mean, they just can't do it. And that's actually a concern I have with some of the things that we've heard uh, where people say, for example, we were talking about landline phones a few moments ago. I'm jumping back to a previous topic where some people say, well, things are just going more and more wireless. Instead of people having a landline phone, let's just have them take a wireless phone. Well, you know, that's great in the abstract, but how much is that going to cost the person? Because right now, you can probably get a landline phone out in rural America somewhere for, you know, what, $10, $15, $20 a month, something like that. It's going to be hard to find a wireless plan that, that cheap in a lot of places, you know. So we need to look at the cost of the consumer and, and kind of back to uh, what you were saying a moment ago. That's, that's a real factor in, in the take rate of people taking the Internet. A lot of people just can't afford it. First, you have to have a computer. And, you know, I know computer costs have gone way, way down. You get a whole lot more for less today than you did a few years ago. But still, there is a cost there. And if you're a low-income person, you don't have an extra five, six, eight hundred dollars laying around where you can, or a thousand dollars or more to go out and buy some gizmo, whether it's a desktop, a laptop, a tablet. You know, you just don't have that. So, anyway, it, it's a challenge, and the funding of this is going to be a challenge. We just need to make sure that we get as much access out there as possible, and we don't leave people behind. Well, Senator Pryor, uh, your colleague Senator McCain has again introduced his a la carte cable bill. I knew that was going to come up. Um, it's Speaking of costs, uh, how do you feel on that? Uh, look, I, I appreciate Senator McCain's passion on this. He, he's filed an a la carte bill basically every year, I think, since I've been to the Senate. Um, and he, he feels passionately about it. Uh, I think we ought to look at it. We ought to consider it. Um, but I also think that we're seeing the market change there as well. Because now, you know, the whole idea of a la carte, and again, intuitively, I think people like this is that when I buy a cable package from, say, you know, Comcast or Time Warner, or whoever I buy from, AT&T, whoever it happens to be, when I buy that, um, I should be able to pick the channels I want. Why do I have to pay for all these channels I don't want? And that's what he's talking about. A la carte means you should be able to go in and pick, and if you want 10, if you want 50, well, it's up to you, but you pick and choose what you want. But that's not the way the cable systems negotiate their contracts 
with the with the uh, with the uh, content folks, you know, with the HBOs and ABCs, et cetera. That's just not how it works. So, in effect, what McCain is saying, we need to go in there and allow people the, the consumer choice. So again, I think a lot of people want that, but that really changes how cable is done today, and, and even how satellite is done, for that matter. So, I think we ought to consider that. But my point a minute ago was that that's changing too, because now if you want to watch, say, shows on NBC. There's websites that you can go to and download those shows, right? And so that's changing as well. We're, this, this whole area is morphing so much. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, Fayetteville, Arkansas had cable. It was one of the first uh, cities in the country to have cable. I think it was the second uh, oldest cable system in the country because of the Ozark Mountains. And you couldn't get any broadcast TV out of Little Rock or whatever. So that you always get TV out of Tulsa and out of Springfield, Missouri and Joplin and stuff. But nonetheless, that was one of the earliest ones, but it is, it is just light years ahead of what that used to be. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy how much this is changing. It continues to change. The question is, will a la carte really be something that is even that desirable for people, as in, say, five years from now, because things are changing so rapidly? But certainly, if Senator McCain wants to talk about that, he's, he's earned that right in the U.S. Senate to bring bills like that up. Jonathan McGesh. Senator, you alluded to how quickly the video and communications landscape generally is changing, perhaps the technology industry as a whole. Is that part of the explanation for why we've seen some reluctance from Congress to take on some of these larger technology-focused pieces of legislation, things like a rewrite of the 1996 Telecommunications Act? We hear people say these laws are very outdated, but at the same time, there's a very real risk of legislating right. and then seeing the market shift under your feet. No, that's exactly right. And if you think about something like a la carte, I mean, I don't know if, if there will be a need for a la carte in five years. I don't know. But it's possible that if Congress gets in and tries to re uh, legislate too much and too specifically in these areas, then all of a sudden, you know, we stifle innovation and, and we prevent the uh, investment that we need to keep that cutting edge in the U.S. economy like we have. You know, I've had people sit in my office and say, we need to rewrite the 96 Telecom Act. I say, all right, tell me why you think so. And they say, well, the Internet is only mentioned twice. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they tell me. And then they say, uh, you know, back then the big fight in 96 was with the telephone companies, the local versus long distance. We've moved so far beyond that, it's not even funny. Okay, that's true, but still, if you look at the innovation in this industry, look at how this industry has driven the U.S. economy, look at the investment, look at how amazing this stuff is and how much it changes and how, you know, there's so much emphasis and so many resources there and it's all great, why do we want to go in and what would, what would we change in the law to, to try to make this better? I think we want to continue to spur innovation and I know there's some fixes we need to do here and there. I mean, this is a funny industry because most people in the industry are hyper competitive and they just fight, fight, fight all day and they complain every day about, you know, this guy's getting a better deal than I am or this industry's getting a better deal than my industry or whatever. But then guess what? They're all doing, I mean, they're all doing great in the terms of they, have, they all have good chances to succeed here and a lot of them have grown and have had a lot of success. Senator Pryor, before we run out of time, I want to ask you about the spectrum incentive auctions. Where do you stand? Where do we stand on those? Is it going to happen in 2014? Is it going to push to 2015? What's going to be your role and your committee's role? I'm totally fine with it happening in 2014. I'm hearing rumors, though, that it may not be quite ready in 2014, so it may slide into 2015. Here again, when we had our wireless hearing, every witness, every other answer, they kept coming back to spectrum, spectrum, spectrum. That's the ball game. And one of the things that we need to talk about, too, and I'm sure you've talked about it on this show before, is the amount of spectrum that the federal government owns. The DOD is kind of the poster child for this, but a lot of other agencies have spectrum as well. And as you know, and your, a lot of your audience will know, that the um, DOD recently came out with a proposal of how they should proceed on some of the spectrum. But you know what? We need to be sensitive to DOD, just as, and, and the other agencies, just as we have uh, utilize these wireless services more and we use the spectrum more in the private sector uh, just for ourselves, they've done the same thing. They, they, they rely on this more and more. Their systems are more and more based on this. They have a bigger investment there than they've ever had. So you can't just kind of flip a switch and move them off. It's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of money to do this. And one of the things is to try to give them the incentive to do it. And I think that's part of the proposal. But 
Um, I would hope that we would get it done in 2014. Uh, my guess is we may, it may slide to 2015, but uh, this is a very important thing. And then there's lots of issues within that about um, do, you, do you let, uh, you know, people just do big national footprints or do you go more locally, regionalized? I mean, there's lots of discussions. You cap people's, uh, uh, companies' uh, ability to, to hold X amount of spectrum and that's it. So, you know, that we have all those questions that are going to have to be resolved. And I think most of those will be resolved by the FCC. But certainly I think that's, this is so important, it again would be a candidate for us to have a hearing on in our subcommittee. Gautham? Finally, I wanted to touch on an yeah. issue that you personally have raised in the past as the chairman of the subcommittee, and that's the issue of accessibility. We've talked about rural communications and rural areas being left behind. There's also a risk of people that are differently able being left behind. Can you speak to the state of that legislation, which I believe is still pending? Yeah, we actually passed some legislation uh, two or three years ago, um, the 21st Century uh, uh, Communications Access Act. Uh, video, I can't remember the exact name of it, but anyway, we passed it, President Obama signed it into law. It's now being implemented, but basically what happened was is as, say, with tele telephony, with just normal telephones, there were requirements about access to the hearing impaired and sight impaired. But when you got to the smartphones, there really was no such requirement. Now, some companies were doing it, and we appreciate that. That's great. But not everybody was doing it. There was no real consistency. So we passed this law. Now the companies are pretty much getting on board about um, how they have to do this and why they do it, and they're doing it, and it's good. Uh, but there are still some bumps in the road. One is um, about closed captioning on the Internet, you know, um, and, and, and some video closed captioning and whatnot to make sure that the deaf and blind community can have full access uh, to, to all the technology we have today. So I, I'm a big supporter of that. I think it's important. And I've talked about not leaving people behind, as you said, and just because you have a disability, I don't want you to be left behind when it comes to this either. You should be able to enjoy the benefits of a smartphone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android or whatever, you know, that's great, or a tablet, whatever it happens to be, um, you should be able to enjoy the benefit of that as well. And finally, Senator Pryor, what grade would you give the federal government when it comes to cybersecurity? Uh, I would say uh, probably kind of C at best. I, I really wish that, that and, and I've been pushing for this in the Senate, that we would move cybersecurity legislation. It's big, it's complicated. That, that word cybersecurity means different things to different people, but we need to get this done. And actually, uh, as hard as it is for me to say that the House has done something right, no, I'm teasing about that, the House, they're, they're fine, but um, they, they've actually passed some of this. And I think that we ought to look at what they've done. And uh, certainly if we want to take a, a stab at doing our own thing in the Senate, that's great, but we need to get moving on this in the Senate. And this is a real threat, it's a real problem, and all of my colleagues who are on the Intelligence Committee, I'm not, but they all lay awake at night worried about cybersecurity. So we need to get this done. It's imperative that we try to do it this year. Senator Mark Pryor has been our guest on The Communicators. Gautam Nagesh has been our guest reporter.